talk about uh, the study uh, for Mock et al. 2021. So this study was, hi Ty, this study was relatively recent. It was uh, published in print in December, so a couple months ago now. And uh, this was a great study uh, given that we've been discussing the transfer of training effects, so the ability of an exercise to transfer to another skill. And uh, in this case, uh, it was the 30 meter sprint. And so that required a lot of acceleration. So athletes in, in most sports, uh, being able to get out of a static stance quickly, so first step quickness, uh, and then being able to change your velocity quickly. So, in other words, being able to accelerate is really important. So, most athletes don't sprint distances where they get up to top speed. So, being able to go from a static start uh, and increase your speed quickly over short distances is really important. Being able to do that repeatedly. So, in this study, um, what was done, uh, two things, looking at a one rep max for a deep back squat. And so uh, some of you may be wondering, well, what is considered a deep back squat? And so if you ever need to know, just come watch Ryder do a squat because he has a really good deep back squat. But an official definition provided by the uh, International Powerlifting Association states that the bottom position or turning point is reached if the top surface of the legs at the hip joint is lower than the top of the knee joint. So that's the definition of a deep squat for this study. So descending to a point where basically the crease of your hip is below the top of the knee joint is considered uh, below parallel or a full range squat. So when they assess one rep max, they uh, made sure that all participants descended at least to that point before coming back up. What's interesting is that with a back squat, the further you descend, the higher the activity of the gluteus maximus. And that's really important. So 
Uh, one of the things we need to emphasize is range of motion, especially with the squat, because if we want good glute activation, we don't get that until we get to those really deep angles of hip and knee flexion. Now, to get there uh, depends on a few factors. So doing a deep squat isn't easy. So the problem with what, what a lot of people do um, is they tend to build up the load on the bar before they really establish that range of motion. So what happens is they end up doing really heavy weight do more of a partial or maybe a three-quarter squat range of motion. So the true benefits of squatting you don't realize until we can get into that good deep range of motion. So there's three things that affect uh, squat range of motion. So I'm, I'm going to talk about squat and then sprints and then we're going to put them together with what they found in this study. So uh, there's three factors that affect your ability to get into this deep squat position. The first is the uh, hip joint. Anatomy. Okay, so that's number one. And you really can't alter that. So the hip joint is made up of what articulation? How many of you have had a previous class where you talked about the hip joint? What, what's the articulation? Yeah, we have the, that's right, we have the femoral head and then the socket of the pelvis, so the, the uh, acetabulum. So the femoral head that articulates within the uh, socket or acetabulum. So people have uh, slightly different variations in their hip anatomy. So some people are able to get a little bit more rotation within that socket before the femoral head uh, bumps against the rim of the acetabulum. Um, and so if you have that type of anatomy, you're going to naturally be able to squat to uh, much deeper angles a lot easier. So you can't modify that. So you're born with uh, a certain structure in the way that your hip joint is designed. Um, two other factors that we can do something about um, ankle mobility is really important. Maybe we don't think about that as much. And when you squat, the ankle needs to dorsi flex. What does dorsi flexion mean? Or leg flexion. Yeah. So visualize a deep squat and, and your angle has to flex. Dorsi flexion. And uh, in order to improve our squat, we have to improve our ability to dorsi flex at the ankle joint. Talk about a drill for that here in just a, a little bit. Um, the last factor is gluteus maximus activation. So these are three key factors. So if you have weak gluteus maximus muscles, uh, when you get into that deep position, uh, we talked about the interaction of the gluteus maximus and hamstring. Uh, if you have uh, weak glutes and they're shutting down when you get to that deep angle, what other hip extensor tends to take over? Hamstrings. Okay, so what's the problem with that? Why is it in a squat we want minimal hamstrings activity? Yes, at what joint? At the knee joint, right? So we have the quadriceps that are trying to extend the knee joint. The hamstrings can extend the hip joint, that's fine, but what else are the hamstrings trying to do with the knee joint? They're trying to flex the knee joint. 
But the problem is your quadriceps are trying to extend the knee joint. So the quadriceps have to do more work than they should to overcome the opposition of the hamstrings at the knee joint. So to eliminate that problem, if we can get really strong glutes, then the hamstrings tend to shut down during the squat because the, because the gluteus maximus is doing his job to extend. And if the hamstrings are shutting down because the glutes are there doing their job, the quadriceps are able to have an easier time extending the, the knee joint. So it, it tends to place less stress on the knee joint, which is also really important. So if we know that our glutes are not as strong as they should be, are there auxiliary exercises that we can include in our program to strengthen the, the glutes? We just talked about it a few days ago. An example, probably the number one. What is it? Hip thrusts. Yes. So all variations of, of hip thrusts are probably the number one way to emphasize strengthening of the gluteus maximus, which can then contribute to better squat performance. So we can modify that one, and we can modify this one. And so when we get into our practical stuff, we'll, we'll go over exercises like this. How many have done something similar to what you see up here now? So you place, uh, you loop the band around the stationary structure, and then the other end of the band you want just underneath the malleoli. How many know what the malleoli of your ankle? Right, so that's the, that's the bony processes on each side. So you have the band looped right under there, so it applies pressure directly into the ankle joint. So you're able to get just a little bit more dorsal. Um, another test that I like to do is called the fist test. So if you make a fist with a thumb and you go over to a wall like this one, um, you should be able to, a fist and a thumb, you should be able to, after warming up a little bit, you should be able to get your knee right about to the wall while keeping your, your heel flat a good test to see if you have sufficient uh, ankle dorsiflexion ability. So things that you can work on to, uh, to better squat issues. Another thing is take some weight off the bar. Right? So work on your form, work on your range of motion before you start stacking all those plates on the bar. Squatting also takes a lot of stability here in the torso, we sometimes call that the core region. So we have to learn to break through our abdominal wall, um, which allows our pelvis to be in the right position for squatting. Because a lot of times the first thing people do when they initiate the squat is they push their hips back too far, which tends to do what with your pelvis? tends to dump your pelvis forward, which your pelvis should be in a neutral position the entire time. So we're not, the, the cue is not to push your hips back. The cue is to brace and sit down. Okay, just like you're trying to sit down with your knee. Brace and sit down. Because if you say something like push your hips back, people tend to overdo it. And then as soon as you emphasize that motion, the pelvis dumps forward. If the pelvis dumps forward, what's happening with your lumbar spine? It's going to be really arched. It should have a little bit of arch, but not excessive. And so we tend to place a lot of stress on our, on our disc. So the appropriate cue, and we'll, we'll talk all about cues in, in practice, but um, brace and then sit straight down and push your knee. So let's go back. So what they did is they looked at 
uh, deep back squat performance. So they looked at absolute and relative deep back squat strength. So what's the difference between absolute and relative strength? Yeah, that's exactly right. So absolute is the, the max, irrespective of how much you weigh, relative is divided by your, your body mass. So how much mass can you lift relative to your body mass. So that's a great way to compare athletes. If you have athletes that are two different sizes and you want to make a valid comparison, you can compare them in relative terms. So how much can they lift relative to their body mass? It makes it easier to compare uh, athletes of different sizes. So, they compared absolute and relative deep back squat strength with 30 meter sprint performance. So they had a bunch of uh, timing gates that they set up at progressive five meter segments. So they were able to get uh, the time for each of those five meter segments. And how they compared the two was through what's called a Pearson, Pearson R. How many have taken a, a, a statistics class and learned about the Pearson R? So it's a way that we compare the relationship or association between two variables. So, Briefly, a Pearson R, you have a scale from negative 1.0 to positive 1.0, and you have 0, 0.0 in the middle. So if two variables are proportionate, in other words, as one variable goes up, the other variable also goes up, then you have a positive correlation. So this would be considered a proportional relationship. So let me give you an example. So you go to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and you're looking at all of these athletes, these different groups of athletes. Guess which team has the highest average vertical jump? It's not basketball. It's volleyball. Okay. Olympic weightlifting team has the highest average vertical jump. Okay. So Olympic weightlifters have the highest average vertical jump of all those teams at the Olympic Training Center. Why do you think that is? might be a connection between maybe they're just talented jumpers to begin with and there's probably some truth to that so you're talking about nature versus nurture nurture is the training part nature is what you have with the genetics so they're probably good jumpers to begin with but their training high velocity high power lift also contributes to that don't so no wonder with volleyball and basketball we take pieces of those olympic it tends to be correlated with having a good vertical jump. So the more the more weight you can do for a say a hang clean, a clean from the hang position, is correlated with jumping ability. That's just an example. So over on this side, we have what we call inverse relationships. So variables that are related but in the opposite direction. In 
can think of an example there. And actually, this study provides a great example. So faster times in the 30 meter sprint for each of those five meter segments were correlated with higher loads lifted for the deep back squat. So a faster sprint time, in other words, as sprint time decreases, which means faster, there were higher loads lifted for, for the deep back squat. So most of the time we don't have perfect positive correlations and we don't have perfect negative correlations, but we can say that when we get somewhere around 0.7 or negative 0.7, that this would be considered a strong relationship. So as you look at studies, you'll see these correlations a lot of the time because it's a good way to establish a relationship or how well something transfers to a sport skill. So as we go here, so with that introduction, taking a look at table two, it should be a little more meaningful now. So each of those five meter segments, zero to five, five to 10 and so on, all the way up 25 to 30, these are the correlation coefficients for absolute squat strength and then relative to uh, body mass. So you can see those correlations are negative meaning that for a given segment, a faster time means what for deep back squat? It means they were, they were lifting more weight, right? And a lot of these correlations would be greater than negative 0.7, which, which means a very strong association. So if you look right here, 25 to 30 meters, so their time during this segment had a strong inverse association with deep back squat performance. So they were running faster during that particular segment, the people that had a stronger lift in the deep back squat. What I, what I also thought was interesting is they compared the top 10% strongest with uh, the 10% the on the weaker side. So taking 10% on, on each end, and they showed that the stronger uh, participants were running significantly faster. So from zero to five, the people that were in the top 10% of strength ran that first five meters in 1.030 seconds versus the 10% on the bottom of the sample, 1.174. So this symbol indicates that this difference is significant. And you can see all the way down, all of these segments are significant. And you can see progressively faster, progressively faster times all the way to 30 meters. So that means they were accelerating with this group as well. It was slower, but they were still speeding up all the way through 30 meters. Okay. So what's the take home message then? If you want to run really fast, what should you be doing? Already do a deep squat. If you can't get deep on a squat, then you need to do some remedial stuff, like this kind of stuff to improve your squat ability is the take home message. So that's a very practical message that we can use to improve performance. Okay, any questions? Okay, all right, so let's 
go back into chapter six. Okay, so we left off uh, talking about hormones. So what are the three categories of hormones? And steroid hormones, and what are they made from? What's the, the base molecule? Cholesterol, made from cholesterol. And then it depends on the enzymes involved that we gradually get androgens or glucocorticoids or mineral corticoids or estrogen. All of these different steroid based hormones are made from uh, cholesterol. So they're lipid based. And because they're lipid based, what do we have to have in the blood to transport these lipid based hormones? How well do lipid based hormones mix with a watery blood environment? Not well. So we have to have a transport molecule to get hormones like testosterone. What's the transport molecule for testosterone? What's the carrier? What's the taxi for testosterone? Is it the sex hormone dominant? Uh, yes. Globulin. globulin. Okay, so that's like a taxi that carries testosterone through the muscle and then releases it, and then it combines with its receptor. For steroid hormones, where is the receptor located? Is it inside the cell or on the surface of the cell? Inside. Inside the cell, because the, the membrane of the cell is made from lipids, so Testosterone can easily cross and bind with its receptor inside the cell. Okay, so that's steroid hormones. What else have we got? Peptide hormones, and they're the most common type. You want to remember that the most common type of hormone. So we went over a few examples. Uh, growth hormone is a peptide hormone. So growth hormone has anabolic effect, but there's lots of different variations of growth hormone with, with various physiological effects that we'll talk about today. All right, so the last category of hormones, which we don't cover a lot in this chapter, but um, important nonetheless for exercise performance, is the last category. Yeah, yeah they're also protein-based amines. Amines. So the example given was catecholamine. What are the two major catecholamine type hormones? Epinephrine, epinephrine and you know what epinephrine made from the amino acid tyrosine. So how many would be willing to admit that they take a pre-workout supplement? Oh, you have a guy to Hey, you just did it. Good for you. Okay, so you look on the label. Chances are you're going to see tyrosine on the label. Why would you see tyrosine on a pre-workout supplement label? It's used to synthesize what? Your catecholamines, right? Epinephrine and norepinephrine are made from tyrosine. What do epinephrine and norepinephrine do? <laughs> yes. So after you take that pre-workout supplement, what are some of the effects that you're feeling subjectively? You're, you feel your heart rate rise a little bit? Okay, yeah, that's what epinephrine does. It's made from tyrosine. So a lot of the pre-workout supplements will have these uh, stimulant type effects. Okay, <clears throat> so getting back to it. Testosterone and other androgens. So androgens, the primary one is testosterone, but we also have a lot of others. We call uh, these other precursors, precursors to testosterone. What does it mean to be a precursor? If you, if you say something is a precursor, what does that mean? So I would say it comes before. So it comes before testosterone. So how many of you were alive in 1998? Remember the home run, the home runs that were going on that summer. Two guys, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire. 
with an epic home run race that Sunday. And it turns out that Mark McGuire broke the home run record held by Roger Maris. And uh, how many did McGuire hit that summer? Was it 70? Yeah, yeah. And then Barry Bonds broke it a few years later. But uh, Sosa also hit something like 66 that summer. <laughs> anyway, so the focus was on what's McGuire doing? Why is he so big and strong? And how's he doing all these home runs? And uh, during an interview um, on camera, they, they showed that he had a bottle of what was called pro hormones in his locker. Pro hormones uh, include things like Androstenedione, Androstenedione, which is a precursor to testosterone. So what came out of it is these pro-hormones, which at that time were available over the counter, so you could buy Androstenedione over the counter. Um, eventually they uh, were used as, as uh, banned substances. You can't buy these testosterone precursors. Just a little piece of history there for you. But um, all of these substances have mild anabolic effects. Not to the same degree as testosterone, but these testosterone precursors, androstenedione, dehydroepiandrosterone, which is sometimes called DHEA, dihydrotestosterone, they can all bind with that testosterone receptor to have anabolic So most of the androgens are produced by the testes. Small amounts of other precursors are, are produced by the adrenal cortex. Uh, females do make some testosterone and other precursors, but most is in the adrenal cortex. Uh, small amounts produced by the ovaries. So in females, do you remember a lot of the testosterone undergoes aromatization? and is converted to uh, estrogen. So in, in females, the testosterone is converted to estrogen. Okay, so how can we get this testosterone response? What type of workout can we put together to get this acute testosterone response? So there's a few prescription-based factors how we design our resistance training determines the hormone response. So a few factors that I listed here. Volume is important. Remember how we defined volume in our, in our prior discussion? How do, we, how do we define resistance training volume? So if you, if you did a workout and you recorded what you did, how would you calculate volume? Load times sets times reps. So it's basically the amount of work. So I don't know, maybe, maybe you don't think of lifting weights as, as work, but it's physical work. So volume is kind of this measure of how much work you do during a workout. It's a way to quantify it. Uh, rest interval between sets can affect testosterone release. Uh, the load, okay, which, which also factors into the volume and the number of, of repetitions you can do, uh, and the mode of exercise. What does that mean, the mode? What are we talking about there? This is on the study guide. The mode of exercise. What are we referring to there? You have resistance training mode. So it, what it's referring to is all the tools that you have available to lift with. So think of we have we have free weights, which are the most popular at these times. What else do we have? We have kettlebells, dumbbells, <laughs> yeah, sandbags, all kinds of stuff. 
cable machine with your knife because you can get horizontal resistance with the cable. You can redirect the resistance to be horizontal. With the free weight, the resistance is always vertical. Okay, because of what? Gravity, right? So no matter what, with the free weight, the resistance you're always resisting in the vertical direction. And then we have all of these resistance uh, training machines that you see. So a little bit more history for you. I love history, especially exercise history. So which which the first uh, National Football League team to hire a full-time strength and conditioning coach? Take a guess. It was back in the 70s. Not the Oilers, but it was in Texas. Are they still American team? <laughs> yeah, right there. Good. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys were the first professional sports team, and I'm not sure what year, it was in the 1970s, to hire a professional strength and conditioning coach, followed closely by the Miami Dolphins. So guess how they used to do things back in the 1970s? Turns out, in the 1970s, uh, we started to have resistance training machines produced. So the first line of resistance training machines was the Nautilus line. How many have heard of Nautilus? I don't know if they're still around today. I think they probably are, but that was the first one. It was invented by Arthur Jones. He was kind of an eccentric guy. He had lots of exotic pets like elephants and all kinds of things. He lived in Florida. So, at any rate, uh, the way that the Dallas Cowboys in the 1970s used to train is they had this entire fancy circus Nautilus machine. And it was based on very little rest between sets. It was, it was uh, moderately heavy weight between 8 and 12 repetitions a set. And they would just go around in this, in this circuit. Okay, so then we got to the 80s, and guess what happened? Machines kind of fell out of popularity and we got back to free weights. And so free weights, really, if, if you look at the research, free weights work really well. So there's a lot of literature that shows that just simple, ground-based type exercises transfer really well to sports skills. So just today, we talked about deep back squat and sprint performance. I could show you other studies that talk about the deep back squat and jump performance. So it really doesn't take a lot of fancy equipment to get this transfer to uh, what we want an athlete to be able to do. So mode of exercise is basically what you're using to provide resistance for the muscles. So we want, we want the mode of exercise to be similar in some aspect to what an athlete is actually doing. So ground-based exercises have a pretty good relationship with sports skills. Okay, so some other research examples where they showed that there was a large increase in testosterone. So here's a study that compared different volumes. So in 1997, three sets of eight exercises with a 10 RM load. What's a 10 RM load? What does that mean? 10 rep max. So a weight that you can lift how many times? 10 but not 11. Okay, so moderate amount of weight, three sets for eight exercises. So what's the total number of sets? Three times eight is so 24 sets, okay, three sets of eight different exercises, so 24 sets total with a 10 RM load, increased blood testosterone levels more than one set of eight exercises at the same intensity. So the 10 RM would be the intensity. So it appears that volume has an important relationship to hormone release. 
So one group did three times the work of the other group and had significantly greater blood testosterone levels. Another study, decreasing the rest interval. Decreasing the rest interval. So that's interesting. Here's a study that actually timed how much rest between sets. So going from three minutes down to one minute when performing sets with a 10 RM load increased blood testosterone levels. How many have ever tried that on purpose during, say, a squat workout to just limit the amount of rest between sets? And you're like, okay, I'm going to, it's, you really don't want to go to that next set, but you're pushing yourself, so you do it anyway. How many have done really short rest intervals between sets of squats? That's tough. Yeah. So that's going to produce probably a little bit more microtrauma, a little more muscle soreness. So why do we need that testosterone release? What does testosterone do after the workout? Muscle repair. Yeah. That's where you get the protein synthesis to, to remodel the muscle and make it better than it was to begin with. Okay, so here's one on mode. If any of you are wondering about whether the mode matters, it does. So testosterone and growth hormone levels increased more with free weight exercise, barbell back squat, versus machine-based exercise, leg press, performed at the same relative intensity. Think about that one. Barbell back squat versus leg press. And you're getting a greater anabolic hormone response. So why do you think? What's the reason? Your squat dynamic is going to be dynamic. It is dynamic. What else? You have to stabilize the body that way. Yeah. You have to, there's a lot more demands going on other than just leg muscles, right? With the leg press. You're basically just sitting there. You push the weight out, let it come back, push the weight out, let it come back. Okay. How specific is that to anything we do in sports? Not very. There's been a lot of problems with leg press. I would stay, I would stay away from the leg press. Okay. I'm gonna go up on this tangent for just a second. So leg press, there's about a four to one ratio in quadricep to hamstring activation with most leg press models. Okay, so your objective is to get massive quadriceps. Okay, that's fine. A leg press is going to do the job. But what about a competitive athlete? What's the problem with having really strong quadriceps and weak hamstrings? What, is the, what do the quadriceps do at the knee joint? This is the femur, this is the tibia. What do the quadriceps want to do? They want to extend, so the hamstrings do. They want to flex. So what's what's going to happen if over time you choose lots of leg press and very little squat? You're going to get very dominant quadriceps. Again, four to one ratio in quadricep to hamstring activation. And then you turn an athlete loose on the field. What's going to tend to happen? Turn the hamstring. What's going to happen is that you have rapid extension of the knee joint with no breaks from the hamstring. What happens when you hyperextend your knee joint? What ligament? What ligament inside the knee joint that prevents hyperextension or should prevent hyperextension? The ACL. The ACL. Yeah. So a leg press is just a, probably not the best option for, for an athlete because you're just getting way too dominant involvement of quadriceps. It's like you're training the accelerator, but you're not doing anything for the brake. So your hamstring, your, your knee's going to be extending with no, with no brakes from the hamstring. So we want to do something with a little more balanced ratio, and the barbell back squat has about a two to one ratio versus four to one quadricep to hamstring. So, plus what Steven said, there's a lot more stabilizing demands. So, we brace through here. So, we're able to 
control our pelvic position, which, which also reduces the risk of, of injuries. All right, so in addition to increasing testosterone levels, we also increase estrogen receptors. And what do we talk about on Monday? It's really important just after a workout to get those androgen receptors up. You gotta have some food within that hour window because then we can upregulate androgen receptors and then the testosterone in the blood is taken up by the muscle to bind with those receptors. And so you have to have that receptor hormone interaction to unlock protein synthesis. So here's another practic practical example. Eight sets of eight repetitions. I kind of like that prescription. Eight by eight. Eight by eight of the barbell back squat increased androgen receptors 63 to 102%. So we're talking a lot about barbell back squat today. So that's definitely something that should be included in the program. Barbell back squat, we get so many benefits from that. Um, increased receptor numbers means that the cell is going to be more sensitive to the hormone. Okay, so growth hormone, where does it come from? Anterior pituitary. And we produce growth hormone. Lots of different variations of growth hormone. Growth hormone has muscle building effects. And so the prescription the type of workout to raise growth hormone levels, high volume weight training, so eight exercises, three sets per exercise at a 10 rep max with relatively short rest intervals, engages large muscle groups, okay, can elevate GH, Okay, growth hormone, hormone levels, 30 to 60 minutes post-exercise in both men and, and women. The rest interval is especially important. And so the, the, the GH response is correlated with hypertrophy in the long term. So we can see that if you're doing a workout like this one that gets your, gets your growth hormone levels up, that's correlated with hypertrophy after 20 weeks. So that's what we say this type of workout is, is more of a hypertrophy muscle building type workout. Okay, here's another study. So I want you to take a look at the title. So acute and chronic hormonal responses to resistance training designed to promote muscle hypertrophy. So this study was done over 20 years ago, but Still has a very practical type of message. I want you to take a moment and just read through the slide. Just look up here and read through that slide. Read through the method, what they did, the type of workout that they did. So this workout was uh, lots, it looks like lots of biceps to this one, four exercises. Emphasize the biceps brachii. Free weights in the weight machines. So they measured, measured strength, muscle cross-sectional area, muscle fiber cross-sectional area, the biceps brachii. So what they found, and again, keep, keep this discussion of correlations in mind, that's what these correlations are, is, is what we talked about today. So correlations were found between the mean absolute exercise-induced GH increases. So how much growth hormone was released 
after the workout. And that was correlated with the relative degree of type 1. And what are we referring to here with type 1? What do we know from chapter 4? Type 1, type 1 what? Muscle cell. Yeah, muscle cell. Type 1 and type 2, fiber hypertrophy. So both types of fibers, type 1 and type 2, both types of muscle cell fibers grew in response. Take a look at these correlations at the midpoint, 0.62, which means, and then at the post, 0 0.71, 0 0.70, 0 0.74. So those are pretty strong correlations. So that means as, as the growth hormone response went up, the size of those muscle fibers also went up. So that's a proportional relationship. Okay, so more about growth hormone. The muscle building effects of growth hormone have a lot to do with this related hormone called insulin-like growth factor. How many have heard of that insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1? So how it works is growth hormone is released from the anterior pituitary. Okay, we already said that. Growth hormone circulates to the liver and binds with receptors on the liver. So it's the liver that produces this insulin-like growth factor. We get that from the liver. Now, Growth hormone can also bind to receptors on skeletal muscle. So how is it that this growth hormone response means that we get bigger muscles over time? Growth hormone binds with receptors on skeletal muscle, and then skeletal muscle produces this additional hormone called mechanogrowth growth factor. Mechanogrowth growth factor. Okay, so is everybody clear on that? So, Growth hormone from the anterior pituitary binds with receptors on the liver. The liver produces insulin-like growth factor. Growth hormone binds with receptors on skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle produces mechano growth factor. So these two, IGF-1 and mechano growth factor, promote muscle growth. So there's some differing opinions on this, but a lot of the anabolic effects of growth hormone are believed to be due to this insulin-like growth factor. So a lot of anabolic uh, androgenic steroid users will combine that with growth hormone. And insulin. Okay. The problem is that long term use of growth hormone tends to reduce insulin sensitivity. What does that mean to have reduced insulin sensitivity? Why is that a problem? What does insulin do? It facilitates the uptake of glucose from the blood into the muscle. So if you're injecting Anabolic androgenic steroids along with injecting growth hormone over long periods of time that can increase insulin resistance <clears throat> or reduce insulin sensitivity. That's a problem. So a lot of times, in addition to growth hormone, they will also combine insulin. Also combine insulin to overcome the effects of growth hormone on insulin sensitivity. Okay, so here's a study guide question for you. So what are some of the other effects of growth hormone in addition to muscle building? So if you look up here. Yeah, well that's one thing. So other beneficial effects. 
strengthening of connective tissue. So what, what's connective tissue? What are we talking about when we say connective tissue? What specifically? Tendons, ligaments, fascia. So those fascial layers. Why is it important that you have stronger connective tissue? Muscles produce force. They pull on tendons. You can damage tendons if muscles are stronger than what the tendon can withstand. So stronger connective tissue is really important. Enhancement of lipolysis. What's lipolysis? Lipolysis, fat burning. How many of you, for cardiovascular benefits, have done high intensity interval training? That's a great method to burn body fat. And one of the reasons is because of growth hormone. So that high intensity interval exercise with short rest intervals between sprints or whatever the mode of exercise you're doing promotes a large increase in growth hormone. So it's not just the resistance training, it's the, the high intensity interval training that we get this growth hormone response. And so that increases lipolysis in fat burning in the in the post-exercise period, in the post-exercise period. So it's been shown that with interval training, our metabolism can be elevated for up to 24 hours after a workout. So you think about that. Your metabolism is burning calories, fat calories, at an accelerated rate for several hours after the workout ends. So our high intensity interval workout lasts for how long? You know, 20, 30 minutes, right? But then you, for the next 24 hours, you're burning these fat calories at an elevated rate. So that makes a huge difference on building muscle and also losing uh, body fat. Okay, so some other things. Uh, we mentioned hypertrophy, we mentioned lipolysis, glycogenolysis. What does that mean? Glycogenolysis. Synthesis of Training your body to burn more fat, which is good, because that makes your body composition better, but you're also training your body to spare carbohydrates. So you're promoting this 